and we're both and we're all cooperating. If I call up a pizza joint and I place an order, and a person on the the person on the phone and I are cooperating. The person on the phone and the cook are cooperating. The cook and the delivery man are cooperating. The delivery man is cooperating in traffic with other drivers. And the delivery man and I are cooperating when I pay for the pizza. This is what makes the world go round. And if it turns out that I have this entirely wrong, that is, if people conflict more than they cooperate, this entire theory of anarcho-capitalism is wrong and can never be right. So, I'll try to point that out. <laughs> in the previous lecture, so this is actually part two of some of you But in the previous lecture, we discussed two important principles, the two important principles of anarcho capitalism. That is the sovereignty of the individual, the idea that all people own themselves to begin with. That is to say, people are free to do with themselves what they wish, and they are responsible for everything they do. And the non aggression axiom, which is a fancy way of saying that all actions between individuals and their property must be voluntary. When we, we then applied these to various areas of interest and saw that guns, gay marriage, and drugs should not be outlawed. Whereas universal health care, okay, governmental licensing, and monopolies should be. We even touched upon the concept of anarchic justice and defense, which are the topics of this discussion. Now these can, should, and would be privatized if only there weren't some armed gang preventing entry into the market. Now those, <laughs> yeah, I tried to get a little roar here, but you have no idea how complicated 2007 is. All right, what do you do? I guess I threw that away too early. Crap. Talk amongst yourselves. Oh, this is not good. Okay, well, darn it. Yarn. Did anyone see where I threw that piece of paper? <laughs> found it. Found it. Sorry. Oh, goodness. How amazing is that? <laughs> Sorry. Now, for those of you who remember, now those of you from the first lecture remember the crazy discussion that followed with donut shaped rape lands filled with zombies created once the FDA was abolished. Now, this got a little out of control and it got a little out of hand. For this lecture, we're going to assume that human nature. Is, a, is how I have said above, and that this is not likely to change in the near future. Counterfactual conditionals are all in good fun, and we'll probably have a few good ones in the Q&A section that follows, but let me get this straight right off the bat. Rape land, or any variation thereof, cannot exist <laughs> because it necessarily violates the non-aggression axiom, which requires voluntary interaction. Oh, and zombies aren't real. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 However, in the world of human interactions, all human actions based on the desire to feel unachieved ends. However, unachieved ends are not nearly enough, and these ends must also be expected to be attained by certain modes of behavior. That is, individuals must have an idea about how to accomplish their desire in addition to the wish to attain their ends in order to act. These ideas do not necessarily need to be accurate, nor are their ends practical for there to be action, though this does help. And after generations of weeding out the ineffective actors through natural selection, people have gotten quite good at seeking out, seeking out and achieving their ends. This is not to be confused with the often misleading assumption that people are always rational and always self-interested. Rest assured, we're not, leave, we're not living in a surrealistic landscape of Dolly, and our lives aren't as labyrinthine as a Borges novel, or Borges, but nor are we living in the environments for which our brains were grown for. As we previously mentioned, at least 95% of our evolutionary history has been spent in sub-Saharan African, in tribes in which we were either genetically related or knew intimately everyone around us. And our brains were developed to understand this world. In such an environment, sharing resources, labor, material, technology, good stories, etc., would lead to more people surviving and procreating. Since the people who are procreating are to a large extent your family, it is in the interest of your genes whose sole purpose is to see themselves replicate into a and take up a larger portion of the gene pool, to have you help them as best they can. Altruism in such environments is praised because it leads to greater fitness for your genes, and selfishness, which in the long run does not increase the fitness of genes as well as altruism, is punished. The anthropological bears this out. The anthropological record bears this out very well. Well, since resources were shared and wealth accumulation almost completely of unheard of to our ancestors, it is natural that many of us respond to the free market system 
with its expressed purpose of generating wealth for individuals, was skepticism, fear, and anger. Many people who have an intimate expectation, oh, that's not intimate. Many people have an innate expectation that someone or something more powerful than those greedy capitalist, fat, selfish capitalist pigs should step in and, cre and correct this inequality of wealth. Michael Sch Shermer refers to this as evolutionary egalitarianism. However, people do have a strong desire to have things for themselves. That is, people wish to have better lives. The ultimate reason most people, the ultimate reason people wish to live better lives, is because those that did not wish to left fewer ancestors than those who wished to. Now we are their end product. Modern humans are a hodgepodge of selfishness and altruistic desires. As Shermer noted, as Shermer notes, a tension arises out of ourselves. A tension arises between our selfish desire to gain greater wealth and our social desire for equality or at least that no one be inordinately unequal, either too rich or too poor. In monstrously large modern states, we have both abject poverty and unimaginable wealth, which causes considerable consternation. In most nations, this translates into political policy to raise the poor and lower the rich. Does this sound familiar? Because during our evolutionary tenure, we lived in a zero-sum, win-lose world in which a person, one person's gain meant another person's loss. This is at least one argument for the creation of the state. Others are listed elsewhere, and my bibliography at the end lists a few, so if you're interested, you can check out a few of those. Now we have come to the idea of the state. And while its origins are of importance elsewhere, here we will restrict ourselves simply to a discussion of the popular rationalizations used to justify the state. We will look at two leading proponents of the state. Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, and we'll see where they went wrong. Yeah, that falls in mind. Perhaps the single most believed argument in favor of the state, popularized by Thomas Hobbes, is the fact, in fact, okay, in fact, I'd be willing to bet wager that practically everyone in this room believes in it to an extent. Hobbes contends that the state is necessary to keep people from hurting one another. He claims that in the state of nature, a fictitious abstraction, which used when evidence of actual human nature was unavailable, that there will be a war of all against all, and life would be nasty, brutish, and short. Hobbes' state of nature is full of cutthroats and backstabbers. Somehow, a state forms that is full of unheard of benevolence and steps in to stop this chaos. Hobbes holds that the formation of government and all the citizens, Hobbes holds that with the formation of government, all the citizens can tr trust each other to cooperate because of mutual fear of punishment should they break the laws of the government. This, in a nutshell, is why people agree to get along under a state, at least according to Tommy Hobbes. But this argument, as Roderick T. Long points out, assumes great many things. It assumes that there cannot be cooperation without law. It assumes that there can be no law without enfor no law that is not enforced without physical force. And it assumes that enforcement cannot happen unless there's a coercive state monopoly. Well, each one of these assumptions is completely wrong. Thus, Hobbes is wrong. <laughs> Cooperation is implicit in human nature, as we established earlier in this talk. For further proof of this, take the converse. That is, there's more conflict than cooperation among people. If we were all on an island, and for some reason the on an island conjecture seems to help people understand, and if instead of helping each other gather wood, build huts, share foods, we instead steal from, hurt, and kill one another, how long do you think will last? If no one's gathering wood, building huts, or hunting game, and instead simply waiting to steal from someone who is doing those things, there will be a lot of cold, hungry thieves. If we are too busy breaking each other's bones instead of working together to thrive on the island, many of us will be put out of commission and the total productivity of the island and the rest of the community will be harmed. If, as Hobbes believes, we are all busy killing one another and spending all of our time simply defending ourselves against attacks from others, it is easy to see that little to no food or supplies will be gathered. It is clear to see that an island of murderers cannot survive. Evolution has removed most of the bad actors, so much so that Hobbes' first point and his first assumption are utterly wrong. Well, what if there is a law? Certainly it needs to be backed by physical force. Nope. One prime example to note is the law merchant or merchant law of the Middle Ages, where laws were not backed by the threat of punishment, by the threat, but by the threat of ostracism and boycott. 
This is not to suggest that force shouldn't be excluded from law enforcement, but rather to highlight the fact that it 